Hi, I'm attorney Andy Contaglia. I get a lot of questions about what happens on a criminal case. So in this video, I'm taking the opportunity to sort of walk through uh, a criminal case from the beginning to the end to help educate you um, and be prepared if anything happens to you or happens to someone that you care about. So here it is, walking you through from the beginning to the end of a criminal case. All right, so let's talk about a criminal case. What is the anatomy of a criminal case? What happens? How, how does a criminal case get started? And where does it go all the way through to the end of a trial? Well, all criminal cases start off with a police investigation. That can be initiated by a witness. It can be initiated by an event that happens. But the police will always be the ones um, who start the investigation. They will execute search warrants. That is an opportunity when they get a court order to search the premises of someone that they are investigating. Sometimes it's a car, sometimes it's a home, sometimes it's a business, but they have to get a search warrant signed off on by a judge and that begins their evidence gathering process of items that they haven't been able to gather up to that point. So it's one thing if a police officer witnesses an event like a car accident or shows up at a car accident and sees that there's spilled alcohol all over the car. That's evidence that they can gather right there and then, but it might be different if they say, somebody assaulted me with a bat and now we have an idea of who this person is. We have an idea of the clothing that they were wearing. And so now what we wanna do is get a search warrant for this person's home to see if we can find the bat to see if we can find the cap that they were wearing or the jersey that they were wearing at the time that the crime happened to help match up the identity of the person who committed the crime. So you may have these, issues, these ideas of search warrants. Police officers will also interview um, the client, your client. At that point, the person who they believe is the, um, the suspect or the accused, All right? The police will either sit down at the, uh, at the scene of what happened and interview you about what happened, tell you that you're not under arrest, and ask you about your version of events. Other times they will take you into the police department and they will sit you down in an interview, in an interview room and ask you what happened and ask for your side of the story. Sometimes they'll show up at a house and they will separate a couple and one police officer will go interview one person and the other police officer will go interview the other one and then the police officers will come back and they will match up their stories to see if anybody needs to go to jail tonight. Right? But this is how the process starts. They interview witnesses. Once this happens, then your client at that point is accused of a crime and they are arrested. In some circumstances with low level cases, they can be issued a summons. A summons is just a promise to appear in court on a particular date. With your low level traffic cases, petty offenses, and misdemeanor cases, this is typically what happens. On some misdemeanor cases like uh, domestic violence, where there's like an assault that happened, it requires that um, an arrest actually take place. But most of the time you can be just served a summons, just like you'd be given a parking ticket or a speeding ticket, but it's a summons to appear in court. On the more complicated cases, you might get um, served what's referred to as a complaint and information. This is after the case is thoroughly investigated by law enforcement. It then goes to a detective at that agency who prepares arrest affidavits and affidavits for complaint and information for the district attorney's office. Then the district attorney's office processes the facts, reviews the facts and decides what charges they want to bring against your client. And the charging document is referred to as the complaint and information and they sign off on that complaint. In some instances, you might get an indictment. An indictment, oops, an indictment comes down from a grand jury. So a grand jury is put together by the district attorney's office to review evidence to determine if there's probable cause that a crime was committed. And you end up with a grand jury indictment. You get indictments on cases that are incredibly complex. Colorado Organized Crime and Control Act, coca cases, you know, racketeering, um, big white collar crime type of things where there's massive amounts of evidence 
and they're looking to bring several counts against people. Because the stage from complaint and information goes to a preliminary hearing while an indictment goes straight to, to district court. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Once that happens, then your client will be arrested. Once the arrest happens, they have an, they have, um, an obligation. They, the prosecutors, have an obligation to bring that person before a judge within 48 hours to be advised of the charges against them. Yes, your question, please. Superseding indictments? That's the same thing as an indictment. It's just a fancy way of saying it. Well, usually the process in an indictment with a grand jury is grand juries, depending on where they are, there's a state grand jury, each county has their own grand jury, and then there's federal grand juries. Okay, so in, in a federal case, no charges are ever filed against anybody without going through the grand jury first. Okay, so the federal process is a little bit different than the state process. But at the grand jury level, the process is exactly the same. If I'm the prosecutor, I will have a grand jury and I will put on witnesses and I will ask the witnesses questions. I will ask what happened, what did Sean do, what did Laura do? And I will ask those witnesses to give information. The, uh, the human trafficking case that we had early on came down by indictment. And they actually subpoenaed my client in to the grand jury to testify against herself. And they kind of bamboozled her into giving her testimony, saying that she was a witness and not a suspect. So she came in and spilled her guts about everything that had happened. And based on her own testimony, they indicted her on human trafficking and a number of other charges. So that's what ends up happening. So the prosecutor puts on evidence, they put on witnesses, they put on um, you know, exhibits, and then what ends up happening is they say, now, ladies and gentlemen of the grand jury, I'm asking you to return an indictment against the defend or against this person on these following charges. And here are the elements of the charges. If you find that the facts have been presented, indict on these charges. If you find that they have not been, then don't. Does that make sense? It just means that there are a lot of people being charged. <laughs> Possibly, yeah, I'd have to look at it. But many times what ends up happening is you'll see a number of people, like 10 people being part of the indictment. And then the prosecutor will have a list of 25 charges and they'll have defendant one is you know indicted on charges number one three five seven nine and twenty six and then number two and then they'll go through all the ones that that person is involved in and they'll go through and and list all those so there's different ways that they you know sort of organize those up um to have them you know come forth if that makes sense yeah <laughs> she could have, but she didn't. Um, and the requirement in Colorado is on the subpoena, they have to tell you that you have a right to get a lawyer and not to testify. But she did neither of those things. Um, no, it's also in the federal. You have no obligation to testify. You can, keep, you can exercise your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent if you think you're going to be you know, a, accused of something. And you know, they don't really, the prosecutors don't really tell you that which is why get a lawyer. You have a right to one, get it. And for whatever reason, nobody does that. You have the right to remain silent, do it. All right, once you get advised of the charges against you, I know we're short on time, but I wanna get through this real quick. It's not that long. Bond is set, bond is, is bail. Um, you can post a, a certain bond and be released from custody um, and bond out. And if you don't bond out, then you end up, and your client ends up staying in jail. You end up with some preliminary proceedings. In Colorado, 
you're entitled to a preliminary hearing, which is a court determination of probable cause, whether a crime was committed. You're entitled to a preliminary hearing on class one, two, or three felonies, or class four felonies if there are allegations of sex assault, or if you are in custody at the time your preliminary hearing comes up. Otherwise, you're entitled to a disposition hearing on all felonies, four, fives, and sixes. Um, all of these must happen within 35 days of when you receive your charges. Otherwise, you'll have your first appearance um, on misdemeanor traffic and petty offense charges, and that's your, your first meeting with the district attorney. If you end up getting indicted, you'll end up being advised on the indictment, and the judge will read through um, all the charges against you and what you're entitled to. You're also entitled to what's referred to as a probable cause review of the grand jury indictment by the judge. So all of the, tr the transcripts, all the witness testimony, everything is, is saved and will be unsealed. And you can ask the court to make a probable cause review of the information uh, or of the, uh, of the uh, testimony to decide if there's probable cause on the charges that you've been indicted on. Um, in the human trafficking case we had, we asked the judge to do a probable cause review. And of the 10 charges our client was charged with, the judge dismissed two of them. So that was a great beginning to the case also. Once you have these preliminary proceedings, then the case is bound over to district court. They all start in county court, which is the lower level of court. But then once you complete this preliminary phase, then the case gets bound over to district court if it's a felony. Otherwise, it stays in county court if it's a misdemeanor or petty offense or traffic. Um, then you go to arraignment. Arraignment is whether you enter a guilty plea or a not guilty plea. You'll enter a guilty plea if you're taking a plea bargain or you just don't want to fight the charges. Otherwise, you'll enter a not guilty plea and you'll set the case to trial. As part of the trial phase, you'll prepare what is referred to as you'll have a motions hearing and you'll prepare motions. And in your motions, you'll challenge the evidence for trial. So you'll challenge search warrants. You'll, ch you'll challenge searches and seizures. You'll challenge whether your client gave a voluntary statement because he or she was not Mirandized. So you'll challenge the presentation of evidence at that phase. Motions to suppress. Constitutional challenges that statutes are unconstitutional. Um, due process challenges that you're client was not treated fairly in the process that the you know the accused is a black person and when they went to do a lineup it was the black person and six white people um, and so it was a you know a due process with the, the lineup um, so there's ways that you can challenge it at that phase um, and then you end up going to trial you'll go through jury selection opening statements and then the prosecution presents the, their case on it. And then once that's done, then the defense presents their case. And then you close. And that's the closing argument. That's the Perry Mason. That's, you know, everything. That's, you know, the end of A Time to Kill with Matthew McConaughey when everybody is crying and, and everybody wants Samuel L. Jackson to go home to his family. That's what happens. All right. And then you end up with an acquittal, which is a not guilty, or you end up being convicted. Um, if it's an acquittal, then you go home. If it's a found guilty, then you move on to the sentencing phase of the case. Um, sentencing is where you then present your arguments to the court, and the court decides what the sentence is going to be. The prosecution will present his or her um, argument as to what the appropriate sentence should be. Do you deserve, or does your client deserve probation? Do they deserve to go to prison? Um, should they be released, you know, pending um, sentencing, that kind of thing? And then appealing any conviction at a later date. Um, you know, you can always challenge um, verdicts at that point. So, um, any questions based on all of that information that I have now forced down all of your throats? <laughs> all right? I just have one question. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.